to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 1 for June the 7th, 2015. We begin Unit 1 today entitled Amos Rails Against Injustice. And our topic for today taken from the Adult Quarterly is Injustice is Intolerable. Injustice is Intolerable. Uh, devotional read is taken from Psalm 75. Our background scripture is Amos chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 16. And our print passage today is taken from the book of Amos chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 8. Our key verse reads, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord, and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. Amos chapter 2, uh, verse 4. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to review God's judgment of Judah and Israel. Number two, encourage sensitivity towards social injustice. And number three, address issues of injustice in local and global communities. We certainly thank and praise God for the privilege of being able to share another word with you from our Sunday School lesson as we begin our summer quarter uh, for 2015. Uh, we begin... Um, uh, with a little bit of history, uh, particularly from one of the minor prophets, uh, the book of Amos. And maybe you uh, haven't had opportunity to know or to read about him. But I wanted to begin today, uh, even though we have four verses, there's a lot of history here. and We're going to try to cover uh, quite a bit uh, and give you some scripture so we can have a good foundation of what we will be talking about today. So we're going to read a little background um, uh, for the book of Amos and then we'll read uh, some of the biblical context that is offered in our quarterly. Uh, but the book of uh, Amos, uh, he is the author. Uh, he was from a town uh, called Tekoa in Judah. Uh, it was a village some five miles south of Bethlehem. And it was his home. He was a man of several trades. Uh, he was a shepherd, uh, livestock, breeder, a dresser of, of sycamore fig trees. And although his background was rural and apparently isolated from centers of learning, Amos clearly knew the surrounding nations and was acquainted with international history. He was also familiar with both history of uh, the history of God's covenant people and the covenant itself, as his numerous references to the law make clear. Amos had not studied to be a prophet, uh, but the Lord sovereignly called him to this office. He ministered primarily to the northern kingdom of Israel, although his prophecies also address the sins of Judah. Uh, you can see some reference, and we will be there today in uh, Amos chapter 2, uh, verse 4, verse 5, and then also the ninth chapter of uh, Amos, uh, verse 11. And the biblical context for this lesson is as follows. Amos prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam the second, and that was in uh, the year 293 through 5, uh, I'm sorry, 793 to 753 B.C., a time of great prosperity in Israel. In fact, Israel's borders were at their greatest extent uh, since the time of King Solomon. Israel's enemies, the Syrians and Babylonians, were in a weakened state. The people worshipped God along with the pagan gods of the region. Uh, the wealthy took pride in sacrificing to God, 
believing that their wealth was a sign of God's blessings and approval. However, Amos made it clear that this was not the case. So also uh, Amos chapter 2 verse 6 and 7 and chapter 5 verses 11 uh, and 12. And so in the book of Amos, uh, he pretty much focuses on uh, two major areas of sin uh, commonly indicted by the prophets. One was idolatry and the other was social injustice. Uh, Israel's root problem was its false religion, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So we hope that you will uh, go back and, and read some of the background scripture, and we're going to give you some more scripture to uh, support our findings today. We have three uh, outlines that we will be talking about today. Uh, the first one is entitled, This is What the Lord Says. Uh, the second one is three, comma, four sins. And then the third one is a long list of sins. And so as we get into this lesson, uh, after the death of King Solomon, um, the kingdom was divided uh, into two, uh, Judah uh, representing the southern uh, kingdom and Israel, the northern kingdom. And so we find that uh, 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 Amos touched on uh, uh, these indictments, if you will, uh, on both of these nations. Uh, if you go back over into uh, the first chapter of the book of, of Amos, he begins... Uh, with these indictments of, uh, on the surrounding uh, nations, uh, some five, if you will. And then when we get to our lesson today, uh, taken from the second chapter, uh, beginning at, at uh, 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 verse 4, uh, Amos begins to uh, deal with uh, Judah and then uh, Israel, respectively. But, you know, there's nothing, as we get into this lesson, and it is a, a, an extensive history uh, outline, uh, but one thing we want to note, uh, people have not changed uh, over the centuries. Uh, and we want to note that God has not changed in terms of... Uh, uh, his expectation, but this injustice, uh, uh, what we are talking about is the absence of justice, uh, violation uh, of, of right or rights of a person uh, or a group of people uh, or ignored. Uh, and that word intolerable means that it is too bad. It has gotten harsh. It's severe. And it can no longer be accepted or tolerated. So as we talk about this justice uh, that God is looking for and that he's uh, impressing upon these nations that he is punished, uh, uh, even Judah, his own people and Israel, uh, justice is that maintenance or administration of what is just uh, to fairly judge, doing the right thing equity, if you will. God looks for justice in uh, 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 our dealings with one another. He looks for justice uh, uh, in the law that he has given that we would keep it. Uh, and, and so uh, what had happened uh, in the course of history, uh, many nations, uh, uh, and there's, there's a word that, that comes out of this lesson uh, in terms of uh, talking about God is, is his sovereignty. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, we don't hear a lot about that. But even though these pagan nations, uh, God has uh, uh, punished them. Uh, why? Because he's sovereign. Uh, even though uh, there's no covenant, uh, if you will, with these pagan nations, the expectation 
uh, that God still has for his people is that we learn to do good, that we learn what his laws are all about, and that we administer them in our conduct with one another, that we treat one another in a way uh, uh, that is equitable, that is fair. Uh, and when we don't do that and when we uh, uh, fail to adhere to the plan of God in terms of our conduct with one another, uh, we can expect God to step in. And so it had come to a point in history, uh, uh, God raised up this prophet, uh, uh, and that just simply means that he was foretelling, uh, forecasting, and uh, uh, respectively, uh, these events that would take place uh, with these nations. And, you know, in our job as ministers, is not always easy. Uh, depending on what uh, God has to say concerning our actions. And we just need to take note uh, of these prophets and, and how God raised them up uh, in difficult periods of history where uh, uh, mankind failed to heed uh, God's instructions and outright rebelled as we start talking about uh, uh, Judah uh, and, is, and Israel. And so uh, this man, Amos, had no formal training in this area. He uh, was called by God and God equipped him with a word uh, uh, to speak over his people uh, and to let them know that God has had enough. And so we always have to be mindful uh, that our actions, uh, particularly as we disobey God, they provoke him. Uh, to anger, and when he uh, uh, renders an indictment, as we are going to see uh, uh, in this lesson, there is no escape from it. And this formal charge, uh, God, as we get into this lesson, God has had enough of his people's conduct and their sins. And we're going to see some impressive things in this lesson, uh, uh, and particularly as we look at the sin aspect and how uh, uh, it, it, it still uh, reminds me as I read this lesson and some of the conduct, it is the same thing that we are looking at today in our time. So since 793 to 753 B.C., mankind is still rebelling and disobeying God. And so this first outline is, is in, uh, uh, entitled, this is what the Lord says. And so uh, from Amos chapter 2, verse 4a, uh, uh, this uh, uh, first verse simply says, Thus saith the Lord. In the NIV translation, uh, it says, This is what the Lord says. So what does that mean? Uh, it's, it's quite common in the Old Testament dealing with the prophets that they would preface their messages with thus says the Lord or this is what the Lord said uh, uh, says and, and that was to help the listeners understand that this was not a message that came directly uh, from the prophets but they were speaking as God had gave them utterance these words were not the words of Amos but God had chosen him to preach to prophesy to speak on his behalf to his people. And so uh, if we would do that, uh, uh, even today, make sure that what we are telling folk is what the Lord says. In other words, that is listed or in, in uh, context with his word. But here, Amos' words were not his own. He was speaking for God. So he began this section of his book by letting his listeners uh, uh, remember that written texts uh, were read aloud to groups during the time of Amos. This is what the Lord says. He used uh, uh, Yahweh or the personal name uh, for God in the Jewish culture, culture uh, often translated as Jehovah or the Lord uh, in all caps, is the Jewish national name for God. It literally means the self-existent or eternal one. We trace our common phrase, God is God all by himself, from this meaning. So that draws the attention of the hearers. This is what God says. So here the question is asked in the quarterly uh, 
we know that the office of prophet ended uh, during the time of the early church, yet many people today still call themselves modern-day prophets. What are your thoughts about the authenticity of their words? So uh, we want to, uh, uh, certainly God is still using uh, men and women to forecast, but particularly as we get into the New Testament, we're talking about preaching we're talking about proclaiming. We're talking about delivering a message. Uh, and it's very important that we we preface our uh, uh, messages with what the Lord says, that we need to have scripture to support uh, our findings. And so this is very important that the, uh, uh, the, the nations, the children of Israel understand God is speaking to you. God has a word for you and we need to pay attention to that. Uh, because God doesn't have to uh, speak to us. And we see throughout history he had been warning his people and, 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 and encouraging them to learn how to do uh, the righteous thing. So here the second outline is entitled three comma four sins. This is Amos uh, uh, chapter two, verse four B uh, and verse five. Again, from the. King James Version, it says, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err after the which their fathers have walked. Verse 5, But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And we're going to get into uh, some of the specifics of uh, what was going on with these folks uh, that God had uh, had enough uh, of their uh, conduct. But here, uh, Amos says, for three transgressions and for four. And this is not to be taken literally as though there were three things uh, or even four that God uh, was talking about. But in this culture, this uh, ancient uh, Middle Eastern culture, uh, that translation uh, just means that there are many transgressions. There are many transgressions. And God is saying here, I will not turn away the punishment. So they have reached a point with God that uh, he has had enough. So after uh, Amos has delivered these five oracles against pagan nations, uh, then the southern kingdom of Judah is now addressed. Divine judgment moves ever closer to the northern kingdom of Israel where Amos himself prophesied so here uh, the Lord is saying uh, uh, they have despised the law of the Lord you know when I was reading this and as we get into this outline as the people of God let me just say this as the people of God uh, there is a higher responsibility uh, placed upon us and placed upon Judah and even Israel, why? Because they had been given the law. They were in a covenant relationship with God. So God uh, has rendered this indictment saying they have despised the law and they have not kept the commandments. God gave it to them. God gave them leaders to help them understand uh, what he expected from them. So they had many transgressions. and These are very serious uh, judgments. These are very serious indictments. And, and it just tells us that God has seen enough. So God has had enough. So God is saying he's going to send judgment upon Judah and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. So uh, Jerusalem, you, you know, we understand that name means the, the city of peace uh, because Judah had not sought integrity in the Lord 
they would see destruction, not peace. So this prophecy was fulfilled over 150 years later when Nebuchadnezzar II conquered Jerusalem and burned every notable building, including the king's house. If you go back over to 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 8 through 10, you'll see what I'm talking about. So God sits high and looks low and, and he monitors everything. He knows what we're doing. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're saying. And so uh, uh, this is a just uh, punishment. This is a just indictment. Uh, sometimes we feel as though uh, uh, God is being unfair. Uh, and Israel even accused God of being unjust. But, you know, God said, examine your ways and see uh, uh, who is out of order here. So after pronouncing judgment on their foreign neighbors, Amos pronounced judgment on Judah and Israel. We're going to get there in just a minute. The number of transgressions, three and four, were symbolic. Three transgressions literally meant enough, while four transgressions meant more than enough. So God's favor toward Judah and Israel was outweighed by the need for judgment against his chosen people. What was Judah's specific transgression? So that word just simply means transgression means a violation of God's law. So they violated uh, 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 the laws of God. Tragically, they rejected the law of the Lord. The law of Moses had been the foundation of God's covenant uh, with his chosen people. Following these laws set them apart from the pagan nations around them. So, you know, I heard the Spirit of the Lord uh, just uh, talking to me about Romans uh, chapter 1. It talks about man, man being without excuse. We don't have an excuse. Uh, it, we, a lot of time we are quoting scriptures and, and, and these folks, uh, they knew the law. So there was no excuse for them not to abide by this covenant. And I love this here, as it says here in the outline, it was the foundation of who they were. They were in a covenant, this binding agreement. They were chosen people of God. So God's expectation uh, was much higher for them than it was for uh, the pagan nations. So to compound the problem, the people of Judah were led astray by false gods. These were not just any false gods, but the ones their ancestors had followed during the time of the judges and periodically throughout the history of Judah. In other words, God had previously punish the nation of Judah for following after these idol gods. They should have known better. So in punishment, God was preparing to send fire on Judah. This would not mean, this would not be actual fire as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Rather, fire reflected the violent nature of warfare against Judah in years to come, culminating in their exile to Babylon. Uh, you can see reference in Second Kings chapters 24 uh, uh, and 25. But, you know, it, it's very important uh, as people of God that uh, uh, as we learn uh, what pleases the Father, uh, it's incumbent upon us to walk uh, in those commandments. God has always given us instructions. You might say, well, that was the law. Well, now we are following the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who is still teaching us what thus says the Lord. He is still reminding you what Jesus taught. He is still reminding you of what you should do. And, and many times we are chastened because God is, has given us commandments and we are not walking in those commandments. A lot of times the Holy Spirit will convict us uh, that we are not doing uh, what the Lord commanded. So, I said that to say this, God has not changed about uh, 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 his instructions to his people. And, and we, are, we do well to follow uh, all of God's commandments. And so here God had just had uh, enough of their sinfulness. But as we get into this lesson uh, and we start talking about the type of sins, and I'm, I'm going to take a little time and, and read some of the things that they were engaged in.
uh, that uh, provoke God to anger. So here the question is asked in the quarterly, think about the meaning of God's words of judgment for Israel and Judah in Amos time. Given this perspective, what might God's judgment be on church folks today? So that's a very scary thought because at some time, at some point, when God has had enough of our foolishness uh, in the things that, that we are doing as, and, and calling ourselves his people, uh, 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 we are going to uh, be addressed. Uh, sin has always been addressed, always will be addressed. And so we have to remember God is holy. Uh, he has always been holy. He always will be holy. And we were told uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament to be holy as God is holy. So here we shift from the southern uh, kingdom of Judah to the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, taken from Amos chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And again, from the King James Version, uh, it says here, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes that, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid, maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. So what is God saying here? So this indictment here... Um, against Israel, the northern kingdom begins in verse 6. Israel is guilty of social injustice, sexual immorality, and religious abuse. Sell the righteous for silver. Uh, it, this is a reference to the corrupt judicial system. Judges were willing to convict the innocent uh, upon payment of a bribe. So here... Uh, talking about the poor, the Lord had special concern that their rights be protected. Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 28. But they were being sold into slavery for insignificant debts, here symbolized by a pair of sandals. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, indigent slavery in Israel was legal but was carefully limited by the law of Moses. We can see some reference in Exodus chapter 21, verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12, and then 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 18. So Amos uh, uh, chapter 2, if we look at verse 7 here, as we read, go into the same girl. Amos decrees uncontrolled sexual passion. Such behavior was contrary to God's original intention. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 24, and Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. And it profaned God's holy name. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 24. The Mosaic law prohibited sexual union among persons closely related by blood. You can see that in Leviticus chapter 18. Verses 6 through 18. While the Mosaic law does not mention this specific situation, the sharing of a common prostitute, the basic principle would still apply. Very serious charges here uh, that these folks were engaging in. And sometimes uh, 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 we think that God doesn't see what we're doing and where we are. But but the Bible helps us to understand that his eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And so we have to be careful uh, that, that, that when we know the word of God, we are expected to do better. But here in verse 8, 
of Amos chapter 2, it says, And they lay themselves upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine uh, of the condemned in the house of their God. So what is God saying here? They engaged in fertility cult prostitution beside the altars, further profaning the Lord's name. There were many altars in Israel, including those at Bethel. In the third chapter of Amos, verse 14, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, and Gilgal, Hosea chapter 12, verse 11. Their sins of sexual license and idolatry were compounded in that they slept on the clothing taken as pledges for loans to, uh, to the poor. Such garments were not to be kept overnight. You can see reference in Exodus chapter 22, verse 26, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 12 and 13. So the wine of the condemned means wine taken from the poor as payment for unjustly imposed fines. Perhaps drinking, the drinking accompanied the sexual indulgence just mentioned. Very, very serious charge here. So after uh, Amos ended uh, 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 his listing of nations, uh, uh, judging, uh, judged by listing his cousins, the Israelites, again, Amos used a formula of three and four sins to make it clear that Israel, too, had done more than enough to deserve punishment. So God's punishment was assured. I will not turn back my wrath. This would not be a temporary punishment. Israel would be utterly destroyed. You could go over and look at uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, 17. So as we read verses 6 through 8, we can see that Israel had been especially evil. Unlike Amos' pronouncement against the other nations that named only one sin, he named a number of sins uh, uh, against Israel. Isn't this something? So we want to give you some more uh, 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 reference here about this uh, oppression of the poor. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 15, uh, verse 11, uh, and chapter 24, uh, verse 14. So this uh, situation with a man's cloak that was pledged for a debt. You can see that in Exodus chapter uh, 22, uh, verses 26 and 27, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 12 and 13, and Deuteronomy chapter 24, uh, verse 17. So they lounged on these cloaks in their places of worship. So remember the Israelites practiced mixed and mingled religion. They did observe the rituals of the temple as set forth under the law of Moses, but they also mixed uh, in pagan uh, uh, worship practices. You know, we have to be careful as people of God. Uh, you don't hear too much about sanctification uh, uh, anymore, but we have been set apart uh, for the purposes of God. Uh, we have been chosen uh, by God uh, for a particular purpose and a particular reason. So if nothing else, we, we bear... Uh, uh, as children of God, we bear his image and, uh, and uh, his likeness. Uh, that's what we were created for and in. So we must exemplify the characteristics of Christ. So can you imagine God looking down on his people and seeing them engaging in all of the activities that they are and calling themselves the people of God? But a word came to them through the prophet Amos, that God had had enough. And that's the part that we really have to be careful. He won't, God won't strive with man always. He gives us an opportunity to change our ways, uh, to change uh, our attitudes, and to become more reverential about his law and about his covenant uh, and about our relationship with him. And we need to take this thing uh, very serious here. So these folk in Israel, they were drinking wine in holy places. Uh, the, the Israelites were guilty of collecting excessive fines uh, from the poor for petty offenses. Uh, 
these fines paid in wine were claimed as restitution uh, for damage. Uh, it was clear that these claims were either false or exorbitant. So, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we just, uh, uh, we go too far uh, with uh, the things that we do. And, and this is where we, uh, as ministers today, we have to warn. I know it's not popular these days because there's so many messages about blessings and so many messages about prosperity. Uh, but we have to be careful uh, who we serve, uh, about who we serve and who we say we are. But these nations, if we read all of this uh, and see that God was sovereign over these pagan nations, that he uh, uh, had been monitoring their activities and, 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 and they didn't get better. Uh, uh, and so God came in and punished them and then he moved to punish his people. So we hope that uh, you will go back and read all of the scriptures uh, that we gave you. As we said in the outset, there's so many, uh, there's so much history here. But we thank and praise God in these few verses that we were able to make some points uh, that God was not pleased. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, that is the case uh, with mankind. We, we are living and in, in doing things that don't please the Lord and, and, and at some point God is going to step in. So we don't want to take uh, 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 God's grace for granted. Romans chapter 6 uh, asks a very important question. Uh, are we to remain in sin that grace may abound? Paul said may it never be. So don't expect God to just sit back uh, and uh, like he's not in control and that he uh, is not sovereign in all of these situations. Don't ever conclude that God will just let it go and continue to let it go as he always has. But here, uh, there's a question here. Consider Amos prophecies in connection with contemporary situations in which injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, how can your congregation heed God's call to seek acts of injustice? And we just must, uh, you know, we must abide by the word of God and be responsible wherever God has placed us to say uh, and to speak out about these things that we know are in direct uh, uh, contradiction to God's word and his law, things that we have been been taught by God, it's incumbent upon us to do these things, no matter where God places you, what your position is, God expects us to, to live out uh, these commandments uh, in the face of an uh, evil and perverse generation. So we certainly, again, thank and praise God for the privilege, again, to be able to sit down and, and share another word with you. And as we prepare to close, we want to do so with this closing prayer that is offered in our quarterly God of justice, we thank you for being a just God. Help us daily to live lives reflecting that same sense of justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, uh, we pray that you have heard something that will encourage your heart, uh, that will encourage you to uh, not just be a, a, a hearer of the word, but an effectual doer of the word that you would put into practice God's laws and commandments uh, that it may go well with us so until such time that the Lord will permit me to speak another word to you we say God bless you